Great. Wow. I don't know who's going to get it done. Am I on camera? See ya. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'll see ya. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't like this camera in the way. I know. Oh. <laughs> see, if you get around the corner enough, then you should be out of it. Maybe where I end up. You just move it. Move the camera. Uh, Make sure you're not, no one's texting you at know, last six this. Can you just zoom in on, on uh, Kevin when he goes to sleep? <laughs> it's warm in here. Is it me? Um, we all might fall asleep. <laughs> we'll, we'll to sleep after our lunch. Or... It's been tough. Yeah. I don't have a lot of emotional bandwidth right now. Oh, I'm sorry. Unless <laughs> involved, there's, yeah. It's, it's not hard to mention. Uh, yeah, and he found out that he had something that was incurable, so he didn't want to be able to have any diagnosis. So, there's still a lot of adjusting. Yeah, and then there's the whole biz of offering. Yes. Hey, you do that. Mm -hmm. Not my favorite uh, couple of months. <coughs> Soon, so we're always whenever you try to draw on something, you want something happen to happen around. So just not an ideal. So I'm not trying to start packing. <laughs> How it's many the day suitcases? The day before is really boring. Boring. <laughs> I did. Yeah, you did. Yeah, it's a good one. David, you have a place for you at the table as well. All right, I can take that. There's a children's menu you're allowed yes. to walk around. <laughs> Chicken fingers or mac and cheese. There's also grilled cheese. Yeah, grilled cheese. Or quesadilla. <laughs> Something with cheese and a cargo product. Yeah. Or corn dog. Right. Mm, corn dog. Yeah. I actually. You've been doing it. Hi, Roger. How are you? Even how are you? Good. I just made you a co host, so you should check. You should be able to do your camera too. That's He's living a life. He's in the car with tonight's uh, power. He's going to swim full time. He's in the water world. Like, 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 he feels real sorry, but he gets left behind. Like, you see everyone, Roger? Except for me. Hi, Roger. I'm over here. Who's that I'm over here? He wants to be in the corner so he's not seen. Well, I'll raise my hand like this. <laughs> Well, it's possible to pronounce when I look at it. They're going to have it over there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Probably a little much Wednesday? Almost. Yeah, it's one of those trucks because you can see everything. Yeah, it should be. But it was really neat to get that. You only see a lot of that. I hope we'll um, no. I got a couple of drives. I already said yes. I got a couple of ditch things. I got it. I just got lined up more around here, right? Right. Yes. You got it as well? Well, he only had a W in Northern, and then we need it. Good. Three transfers. 
so at this point, the last chance to walk at the bottom of the lake. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Now the only way we can do is with scuba gear. Yeah, Although, which is not happening with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll bet. I'll bet when it's all done. Mm -hmm. I'll bet when when it's all done before they film. We'll get one more chance. Well, I'll have to remember that. If I take that one, that would be so cool. Yeah. 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 I said, I hope you have a very short window to do yeah. that before it's yeah. yeah. One week window to let you do that. And then, yeah. So it looks like, Heather, we got yes, we're ready if you want. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and call the meeting to order. Heather, can you do the roll call, please? Yes. Allison Gould? Here. Tom Duster? Here. Scott Holwick? Here. Roger Lane? Here. Ken Houston? Here. Nelson Tipton? Here. Wes Lowry? Here. Kevin Bowden? Here. Jason Elkins? Here. Claire Bartlett? Here. David Bell? Here. Heather McIntyre is here. And we have uh, Steve Grant Slatter. I just blanked out. Fine. Steve Grant Yeah, here. And Councilmember Martin? Here. All right. So our, the first order of business for today will be uh, the election. Uh, chair, so I'm going to open up the floor for nominations for the uh, board chairperson. I move to recognize Roger Lane. I'll second that. Second that. Third, third, fourth, whatever. Okay. Whole quorum. <laughs> yeah, so I'll take it that there's no second uh, nomination. All right. Um, so the board, um, all in favor of nominating Roger Lang is president for the upcoming uh, water board year. So you want to say hi? Aye. 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 All right. Roger, I apologize. I didn't <laughs> even ask you if you wanted to be president. Would you accept? <laughs> is that good for you, Roger? That's fine. Okay. All right. Well, with that, then uh, I'm going to turn the floor over to you, Roger, for the nomination of the vice chairperson. Okay. Um... So why don't we go ahead with that, uh, and I'll entertain nominations for vice chair. Are there any uh, any nominations from any of the board members? Scott has one. Yes, Scott. Roger, I'd like to nominate Allison by our vote, please. Is there a second? Yeah, I'll second. Um, you second it? I would be pleased. Also be a vice chair. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Congratulations, Allison. Thank you. You too, Roger. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, very good. That was uh, that worked out really well. Just I thought I'd just mention in case Ken hadn't mentioned this. To the reason I'm not down there today is. We're in North Carolina, my wife and I got COVID about 10 days ago, so I figured it'd be best if I'd stay away for a meeting, so that's why I'm here, and uh, sorry to not be there, but anyway, that's just the way it is, so. Um, let's move on to the approval of previous month's meeting. Any uh, comments or concerns about last month's meetings, minutes? Is there a motion to approve them? So moved. Second. Second. Four of us now. I know it's a good one. Gotta take turns. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, then I'm going to second and we'll go ahead and approve the grass moss minutes. Next. Uh, water status report. Who is uh, who Roger? Is that uh, Nelson will do it. Okay, go ahead, Nelson. Okay, thank you, Roger. Well, the same Grand Creek Alliance today is 71 CFS. The 125 year historic average is approximately 125 CFS for this date. Call of St. Grand Creek is the Palmerton Ditch, admin number 5630, with a priority date of May 31st, 1865. <coughs> Call on the main stem of the South Platte River impacting District 5 is Lower Latham, admin number 11,620, and the priority date is October 24th, 1881. Um, 
Ralph Price Reservoir at Button Rock Reserve is full and spilling, elevation of 6,400.2 feet, releasing 30 CFS. Union Reservoir is at an elevation of 26.7 feet, 11,786 acre feet, so it's down approximately 1,000 acre feet from full, and uh, <clears throat> we're releasing 15 CFS. And then on the uh, St. Brand Creek Basin Storage, as of uh, August 1st, 2022, um, it was at 77% from full. And as you can see from the call in St. Brand Creek, with it being Palmerton digits fairly full, I mean, fairly senior. So that called out um, rough and ready oligarchy. So we're releasing out of Pleasant Valley for flows going into rough and ready ditch for irrigation. And we're releasing out of Birch Lake oligarchy reservoir number one for oligarchy ditch irrigation water. So. Any questions, concerns? Go ahead, Austin. What is Palmerton? That's super senior. It's fairly senior. The next uh, senior to it is Lama Supply, and when we get to Lama Supply, that's most of the major ones. There's some smaller ones that are senior to Palmerton and Lama Supply, but next in line is Lama Supply, which is lately, the last several years, Wes, you can correct me, um, last several years, it has been Palmerton right around the middle of August and Lama Supply towards the end. So the water, we're, we're, we're lucky that we have been the last several years to fill um, basin storage so that we can go to storage for, for those ditches, so. When do you think we'll kick in the one month supply or will the call kick in? Um, you know, I don't, uh, I, it, it's dropping quick, so it could be, <laughs> I hate to say it, but it could be end of the week, so, but I don't know. A whole bunch today. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. Hey, there you go. We need the positivity. So Ken, so he, he actually beat us all on the peak flow by by a landslide. So I'm gonna listen to Ken. It's gonna rain and <laughs> we're gonna be we're gonna be okay. So if we don't get rain, it's probably gonna be towards the end of the week. But if we get rain, we'll we'll keep it in. If we get rain for several days, we might be able to keep some Get some other what it really shows you know. is the value of that supplemental CBT supply mm -hmm. and uh, how how much we rely on that. And I think this year though the the river stayed in much longer than originally expected. Mm -hmm. We would have thought that we wouldn't have been as junior a call as long as we were. So feeling good about that, but you know emphasis added, especially coming off that kind of little tour we had today, that that CBT really does help us in these later summer. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you, Nelson. You're welcome, Roger. Uh, are there any public invited to be heard or special presentations? We have none. Okay. Any agenda revisions? I have none. Okay. All right. On to development activity. Um, Ken, are you going to cover that? I'll, I'll let Wes take this one. Thank you. So in front of you, I'm on page nine of your packet, Quill Commercial Center filing one final plat. This is an update. Um, it's an update for acreage. Oftentimes when a plan set comes through, uh, it's at the final stages, but sometimes they're just not quite there. So well, maybe I didn't hear that. It's starting to rain rather ferociously here. Ah. <laughs> yeah, listen to Ken, I'm just saying. Just listen to Ken. <laughs> but for the for sake of discussion, Quell Commercial Center filing one final plat is a 13.194 acre parcel. Um, the historic water rights were all transferred at time of annexation according to the relevant policy. Um, Quell Commercial Center filing one final plat will be in compliance with the city's raw water requirement policy. Upon satisfaction of the 3.516 acre foot deficit at time of final plat approval. Oh, we lost Roger. Hold on. It must really be raining hard. Yeah, yeah really. really must be hard. Can you do it outside? We may need to call him on his home phone. Yeah. Hey, what's the question? Yeah. This 3.194 
it says here 7.017 the city and then it says the remaining 7.017 should be it would be like you would add those together to be 15.1 so the yeah the, i can ask it again uh, right um uh, so the you're on mute, Roger. Okay. Okay. Let's let's go back to development activity. Where did Ken? Where did we leave that? Um, Wes was just going to make a presentation. Okay. So let me just do that. I apologize. I the numbers are right, but let me get you the right number. I, I one second, Roger. So um, we have uh, Quill Commercial Center filing one final plat in front of you. Uh, the uh, total acreage of 13.194, kind of uh, a, a typo. In, actually, it's a, a typo in my report. It's 6.177 acres that'll be transferred to the city ownership. So the remaining 7.017 acres uh, we'll have uh, full requirements due. That deficit is uh, then 3.516. So, quote commercial center filing one final plat will be in compliance with the city's raw water requirement policy upon satisfaction of the 3.516 acre foot deficit. Title final plat approval. Thank you, Tom. I, I kept that was one of the changes that, that I didn't get typed in here, but in my background calculation, I have it. So, that's no problem. I, I just thought maybe I was reading it incorrectly. So that's really all I have, Roger, on that. Six and some change. Any, uh, any questions or concerns about the proposal? Don't Is see. there a motion to approve? Well, I did, I maybe quickly, what, what is the city plan to do with, you said to be used for future municipal purposes but the city's going to own it. So what is that, I guess? So part of that's going to be part of the west side of the Longmont Museum. And I think it's going to be like a parking area, but maybe a future expansion of the building. Sure. I don't know if we're positive. Um, there was just an agreement that, they did, that was reached for them to have that parcel. And so it'll be a partnership. It was originally going to be a parking lot, but there's been talk about other enhancements to Quail Campus overall that might use that space in a different way. The West is right, just yeah. don't talk. No, no, no plans are a good time. I mean, I got the like, parking lot. Maybe we quote it to something else, I guess. Oh, we're very under park at that facility. Yeah. For the yeah. museum and the, uh, we actually are also entering into a parking agreement with the developer, allowing people to park on their property, using the museum and the rest are <laughs> under park there. Oh, yeah. I mean, I do park in the third. That's it. <laughs> anyway, anyway. Are you going to test? Yeah. It, um, having driven by there and you guys have done the map, I think there's a, a river bridge corridor through there. Yeah, I think the uh, part of that's the uh, left hand creek. Left hand creek, you know. So there's going to be some green light okay. part of that. Is that part of what is owned? That's, that that's going to be part of what will be owned and maintained municipal purposes for one. Okay, so we're going to have like. Upper portion? Yeah, yeah. There'll, okay. be like, that, there'll be some parcels that are um, uh, adjacent to Left Hand Creek, and then there'll also be a, an additional lot okay. that'll be used as part of the, um, the museum. Okay, that's great. Um, I move to approve. I'll second that. One favor? Uh, I. Aye. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, next item, both of you, uh, got something for us? I do. <laughs> Good. Can you share it with us? Yes, <laughs> I will. <laughs> um, all right, so last meeting, um, I'm going to pull up my notes, which are on my phone, so I'm not, I promise I'm not, like, texting or <laughs> annoying or anything. Uh, so last meeting we spoke about the water efficiency master plan um, and that we're undergoing an update in the next coming years. Um, so I'm going to talk more about our timeline for that and where we see the update going and um, 
get you all speed back for goals. So here's a little bit of our timeline. Um, we're still on milestone one, developing the scope of work, creating communication plan and outreach materials. Um, but we're hoping to have everything finished and su submitted to the state um, by the end of 2024. Um, that will be when it's due is 2025, and so we're hoping to get above that timeline. Um, so this is just an overview of what we've accomplished. I went over this in our last meeting, but just to, to revisit um, our main partnerships, again, our Efficiency Works and Resource Central, they're the ones who run most of our indoor and outdoor efficiency programs. We've done a couple of outreach um, projects like advertising. We do regular city newsletter articles and outreach through there. A lot of conversion to raw water irrigation in our parks and most of our um, golf courses. And then our automatic uh, meter reading, our AMR meters, are um, still underway. So that's kind of what we accomplished. Here are a couple of charts. Um, the one on the left is our participants um, year to date in all of our uh, programs. So you can see which ones are most popular and which ones we need more work on. Um, and then on the right is our annual water savings based on our indoor and outdoor programs. Um, and as you can see in 2018, we had a significant savings through our indoor programs. And so when we went back to look at those numbers and why we saved, we had so much more participation that year is Efficiency Works did a um, targeted outreach program for multifamily housing. And during that time, we did over 2,000 audits, um, water efficiency audits in apartment complexes and multifamily homes. Um, we provided rebates for nearly 200 toilets and um, thousands of aerators and shower heads, which really is where we're getting that huge update. So this data is important for us to keep in mind as we continue through our update progress, is we wanna to continue to do programs that are this successful. So again, this was through our partner, um, Efficiency Works. We haven't been able to do anything like this since COVID. Um, so hopefully as, as we continue to just navigate our current times um, of unknown, we can continue to do projects like this. I don't foresee that we'd see this big of a participation again um, in Longmont, but hopefully we can get near that number. Um, so that's something to keep in mind as we do our program goals. Can I interrupt with a question? Yeah. A second? yeah. So on Longmont has um, a number of new multifamily projects going up. Uh, a lot of them are aimed at low income, although not all of them. Do our current building codes require that the efficiency, efficient stuff is already in there? I believe so. Colorado is a water smart state, which means that all of our new toilets, sinks, shower heads have to meet a certain standard, which is why we probably won't ever see that big jump again, is because those are all kind of retrofitting things that weren't meeting those design standards. Um, we can't even get the toilets that we used to renovate anymore. Like they don't sell them anywhere. Mm -hmm. So um, as we continue to have new developments, um, our indoor programs will see less participation, um, which is why we also want to make sure we're focusing on our outdoor programs too. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is just a general direction of where um, we see that we want to go. First and foremost, we want to see a more aggressive conservation goal. Um, our current goal through our efficiency program is 10%. On average, we meet that annually, um, but it just kind of depends what kind of water year we're having. Um, our Climate Action Task Force, which was run through the Sustainability Department, um, asked us to do a 35% goal. Um, council approved not that exact number, but for us, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but for us to continue to do more aggressive conservation goals, they have not approved 35% as our goal. Um, so we can talk about if we want to reach for that high. Uh, I don't know if that's the best thing that we want to do, but we, we can see. Um, we also want to make sure that we're addressing our 
climate change impacts on our future water demands and supplies. Um, we currently don't have any language in our water efficiency master plan about climate change, so we want to make sure that we're implementing that language. Secondly, we want to make sure that we're creating um, sustainable and equitable landscapes. Um, so you heard Frank today talk a little bit about our Growing Water Smart workshop that we're going to. That's a workshop that, that Ken and I are attending to um, with a lot of planners and city developers to make sure that we can update our city code and design standards. That's the ultimate goal, um, so that we are hitting those efficiency goals in our development moving forward. Um, so that will be a really good update in October for you all to see how, how that went, but we definitely want to implement those goals into our efficiency update plan. Um, we also want to make sure that the city is acting as a role model. And I'd like to ask you all's opinions. We've talked a little bit about um, curb transitions, but what does the city being a role model for efficiency look like for you all? And, and how can we um, put that into our plan? So this is the hard, hardest piece, but if the city has a way to apply some pressure to the HOAs, which have just vast tracts of bluegrass under their control, and we can't make them do anything about it. Um, so if there is some way that, that incentives could be created, that would be a huge, huge win for conservation. You know, this, they can't stop us from xeriscaping our yards anymore, mm -hmm. but we can't make them xeriscape their lands, their open space. I would probably support that, and I think that some folks in HOAs don't understand that there are laws preventing HOAs from uh, preventing you from mowing waterways. So I think yes. educating the homeowners themselves mm -hmm. to the extent we can make a big difference. Good point. Last 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 summer, I was just told with a shaking <laughs> finger by an HOA <laughs> president, we can't have zero escaping. It's against our covenants. And so, mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. But yeah, you're right. A lot of them don't know. Another point, and this may be a kind of a bigger question, is what happens to the conserved or saved water. I mean, if that water is ultimately just maybe not used by Longmont, but used by another apartment municipality, is the net outcome the same? So I guess from my perspective, I would ask the question, how are we positively and proactively putting water back into the natural stream as opposed to just conserving? an important question and you know to me it's like solarization you know we don't really have a need right now to encourage people to put solar panels on their roofs um, you know it, it's not going to pay our it back pay us back the problem the, the, the thing is if we you know, we're increasing urban density and we are um, probably accommodating a larger population than than the current plan of record says. Um, and if there is drought at the same time, which has an increasing probability as well, then we would like to be ready. So you know, if the water just flows down and eventually ends up in the water table on somewhere on the prairie now, that's okay. But if we increase our capacity to not consume water, then it will serve us well in the future. That that's what I think. Because it's really hard when it, you know, when it's all done by gravity, it's really hard to put it back in the river, right? Upstream. Any other um, feedback on city role models? One of the things we really want to have a conversation. That'll be part of the master planning process is really defining what we feel like we should do as a, as a 
see what does it mean to be a role model as a city. And uh, it, may, it may mean us going much further than we have in the past. Maybe it may be we're happy with where we are. But that's, I think that's a process we want to go through, but we wanted to get you thinking about it. Um, I, mean, I can, in my mind, bring up a lot of things that we can do, but I don't know if that's what our community or our citizens want us to know. So that would be the task. Yeah, I mean, I, one thing I think of when I see a poll like this, right, it's like, what, at what scale are we talking about? Are we, are we thinking about the city as a role model for its citizens? Or are we thinking about the city as a role model for other municipalities or cities, right? So like, do we want to be kind of out in front of a lot of these new innovations and et cetera, such that other cities look upon us and say, oh, what a role model, right? Or are we just talking like the city as a role model for its citizens? So for example, not having you know, leaky irrigation in our parks that, you know, that is obvious to everyone who goes to the park. You know. Yeah, uh, it's framed currently in, in our minds of the municipality being a role model for our community members. But I love that your mind went there, and so maybe that can be like a long-term goal of, of Longmont <coughs> being a water efficiency, a water efficient community that other communities can look towards. Um, currently, I mean, it, that's really in Fort Collins, like they're really water efficient. Um, but we can be there someday too. But I think it's important for us as the city to have efficiency so that our community members can say, well, the city is doing well. Like for example, our turf conversion on the lawn here at this center, like 50% of this yard is water-wise turf, but you would never know that unless you know. So I think it's it's important for us, A, to be efficient and be um, leaders for our community members and educate them on, look at our green grass, but we're using half the water that we used to use. So. Yeah, I mean, I you know, so, I mean, the most obvious step is, of course, like, like I said, leaky irrigation and, and the things that you would look at your neighbors and say, oh, that, that's unfortunate or, or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's the obvious stuff. The less obvious stuff, I think, is the things that we even discussed on the tour today, right, while we were at uh, Northern Water, which is, you know, the, the, the types of conversion projects to lower, you know, water usage uh, on, you know, city managed properties that are perhaps more obvious than the one that's tucked away here in a neighborhood, mm -hmm. you know, like where, where you're, you know, where, where the facilities are here, right? And instead of the places where, like, People really see, you know, it's it's the medians on Ken Pratt, or it's the, you know, like it's all of those places. And I think that like the appropriate signage and, and things, always keeping in mind that people are driving by, you know, that, that they're not walking through those spaces. Um, but somehow, like, try to, to 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 get the word out through some type of uh, signage or, or something, you know. Um, and again, in, in more high visibility spots, you know. um, or even at parks, you know, where people are visiting, et cetera. So if that conversion pro project perhaps didn't take place on the soccer field because there's all kinds of other factors involved with trampoline and everything else, right? But but at parks where uh, on the fringes or, or in places where people are, you know, rather than just back here. Mm -hmm. Um, one question, I, I should know this and I don't because I know we threw out the first water recommendation of the Climate Action Task Force because it was just ridiculous and they didn't know that you can't put the water back into Colorado, but um, then I stopped paying attention and they came back with another goal and that was this one. Is this 35% year over year? 35% from our 2008 or 2002? From our 2019 usage. Two. That it's 35% lower than our 2019 demand at build out. At build out. That, okay. That's that's a lot. Considering yeah, astronomical a lot because yeah, the growth is gonna add, so right. It's like a 70% reduction. That's right. And we're looking at more growth. Yeah. Than the old build-out definition. Yeah. So, so yeah. So it's still silly. 
to, to use a seventy percent reduction per capita, for example. Like it, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because they asked for thirty five percent, but really on a per person basis, that would be ridiculous. Because yeah, because we have we have so many more people in here. Yeah. Yeah. But that's okay. I mean, this our our master planning effort will come up with a. I believe a new number because mm -hmm. we basically we've augmented we've had ten percent, so yeah. Yeah, that's a little bit higher number than ten. Somewhere between ten and thirty five. That's what we'll be. It's my prediction. Mm -hmm. That's part of this planning effort. So, so two things. One, um, as you guys consider the effect that Longman has on its neighbors or within the regional community, um, consider whether that's a passive whether we just do it really well and people should look and see that we do it really well and learn from that, or whether it's more actively participatory in the regional fabric, right? And that's a little challenging because Longmont doesn't have the seamless ability to transfer water assets to other communities, correct? So that, that's, we insulated ourselves a little bit, we kind of know a little wall around what we can do with our water supply easily. But at least from a, a conservation element, I think that should be a more active role should have a leadership role in really working with other communities in their lives because whatever we do doesn't, I mean, it has an incremental effect, but it's really a, a regional effort or a statewide effort that has an effect, right? And then the second thing, Hope, is just, and we talked about this last time, scalability. Um, you know, the HOAs is a great place to start because they're big, untapped, untethered, you know, lots of land, but I can see to think that the, um, the, the the parkway space within at least Old Town and other parts of the community use a lot of water. And if there was a way to scale up reducing the grass component of that, that'd be a big number. And it's not going to be the number we had a couple years back. With participatory decreasing downs, it'd be a big number. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of greasy water and green turf in the parkways that the city technically owns, right? Mm -hmm. So there needs to be a way to figure out how to find resources to provide to those citizens to help them with that. Right. And that's grant funding more than anything else. So it's not really even a water piece, but it's, it's finding the resources to provide as incentive. Right, and that goes back to that equitable piece of ensuring that everyone has equal access. Um, and those who don't have access, that we help them have access, which is important. So what is uh, Longmont's kind of relationship to some of the things that we saw today? So, um, I mean, Northern as our, so does Longmont take the stance, well, we have our own kind of sustainability department, so therefore, uh, are you actively working with Northern on the things that they were presenting, the different types of replacement projects and, and things in the, oh, I forget the name of the, whatever the, uh, Partnership that they have with the Botanic Gardens to have you know particular types of vegetation, etc. Do we are, are we participating in those programs, or do we say, well, we have our own department, and so we're, we'll take care of that ourselves? No, Northern is a huge partner. We definitely participate in almost all the programs that they have. And actually, Frank handed me um, some extra things, so I'll pass these around for you guys. But those are that's all the things that we've participated in with Northern, um, and so. Basically, the biggest partnership with them is that they help us do those large irrigation audits. Um, so for HOAs and commercial properties, golf courses, parks, those types of things. Um, and then they provide so many grants. So we, the city, can apply for their grants. Community members can apply individually. HOAs can apply. Golf courses can apply. And so they're funding a ton of, a ton of these like, turf conversion projects as well. Um, so no, we and, and we don't we do our best not to silo ourselves. Um, sustainability is a really like tight knit community. Um, so sustainability departments and water departments. We, I'm in like five meetings a week of different groups of all across cities um, sure. in the front range. We're all sharing resources and working really closely together. Yeah, and I mean of course that's that's a great thing to hear. Uh, yeah. So we, um, so we all appreciate that. Um, and does Northern do audits? That was some fun here. So hopefully, <laughs> it's raining. Raining. hopefully it's raining out there. Um, does Northern do uh, audits as large in scale as citywide, so all the citywide property, or or are they focus mostly on HOAs, for example? So 
how much smaller um, component bus? Kind of both. So we could eventually have all, our, all, like all city-owned properties audited by Northern. It would just have to be like a project at a time. Yeah. yeah, and and to fill you all in, we're hoping to do one of uh, two parts, actually two part variation audits this year um, through Northern, and it's free to us as an allot. And so they hired that engineering company that they were talking about. It's um, Aqua Engineering, and they come and do a systems analysis on our irrigation systems on like big properties like golf courses and those types of things. And so looking all the way into how it's designed and how we can change that efficiency if we need to. So I'm just curious as to whether like if you were to put enough of those together, enough of those audits together, whether you'd be able to kind of like get a, a slightly more accurate estimate or something as to like what you could expect in the future in terms of your savings. Yeah. Right. So I mean, even if you had three or four kind of, I, I don't know how you would select those somehow representative, right, parks. You had three or four of those done. And then you said, well, if these parks are representative of the other parks that we have our, in our system, then we should be able to save X amount over some number of years or something, right? Mm -hmm. And so at least it would maybe put a little bit kind of firmer bounds on some of the estimates that you're trying to assess for the future. Yeah, that's great. To go back to the, the savings and how you can't put it back in the river, like say say for example we have three parks and we reduce irrigation by thirty percent. Is that thirty percent going like what's the reaction to that thirty percent? Is it going to be consumed somewhere else? Or is there a way that we can choose not to divert it from the West Slope and allow it to flow in its natural basin? I mean, I think taking that next step and thinking of what we're going to do with them mm -hmm. and how we're maybe going to be not just someone who's originally on the front range setting a new trend, but maybe someone who's setting a new trend for the front range that benefits the West Slope. Absolutely. And I think, especially in the bigger Colorado Basin, with all the challenges that we're facing, we're having that type of ability to share would really set our city up as a role model. So you not only be making the efficiency, but you could be doing something with it and something that would be benefiting someone that's not necessarily doing this right now. I think that's a great idea. The question is what approach we would want to take because I believe, and I, I could be wrong and you guys are lawyers and I'm not, but um, uh, as, as, as Ken knows, I really crammed on water law before running for this office, but um, I believe that if we refuse diversions that we were allowed to make, would we not be in danger of losing the right and priority as well as not needing the water? Um, well, um, it's kind of a different answer on our drug flow versus CBD water. Okay. CBD water, the, the underlying decree is owned by the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation. Mm -hmm. um, Water then is stored in Grand Lake. Mm -hmm. um, it's allocated out of Lake Grandview to participants. Um, 310,000 participants in this, a lot of contracts in the CBT system. Um, at the end of the year, so we don't have any say whether or not it's diverted or stored before or mm -hmm. what happens. Basically, um, the system stores what it can. Um, most years, is not full, so they store everything they have the right to. If we don't use it, it would revert back to the system um, to be reallocated the next year to other participants. Um, but we don't lose our allocation priority. We, we don't lose our the underlying water right because that, that will still continue to be diverted and used. Um, a greater conversation could be had with Northern and really the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation, if we, you know, if, if, if there was a desire of the greater society to, to, to put some of that water on past Lake Remedy, <laughs> that would be that would be way beyond what we would have control of. Um, in terms of our native basin supply, 
we do have you know, our guiding water principles. And one of our principles is that we will use um, some of our supply um, for environmental benefits if it doesn't, if it's excess in any given time and doesn't impact our overall water supply. So there, there are things we can do. Um, but frankly, we've always found it more effective over the years to do it with oper operationally rather than if we just say here, river, here's some water, we have no right to, to keep the first ditch downstream from home. So, yeah, that's a, that's a huge, that's a huge area. <laughs> um, you know, I would argue our water conservation beyond being the right thing to do, um, and uh, it will help us move forward, you know, for future water supplies. But it also can help uh, if, if we reach a point where there is some excess, um, it could certainly be used for environmental mitigation if we do it very carefully. Well, and I think what you would want to do is target a very specific objective, right? It's not just, well, we keep some water in the river for the fish right? or whatever, right? You target something really specific. So maybe you've identified a particularly rich spawning ground or something that happens to be in between two places where you know you can release some water here and it won't be taken until it gets here, right? And so even if even if the next downstream user does take it, then it doesn't matter that the benefit has already been had, right? And so, you know, if you looked for those types of opportunities, then you have a really tangible benefit rather than just kind of more a more ambiguous one, right? So if you could really target something super specific that you could actually say, okay, this is the spot that can help or something. I think another another thing to be considered is risk management. Um, you know, for a long time organizations like Sierra Club were saying no more dams, no more reservoirs, we're keeping the natural environment natural. And they've kind of backed off on that as they have understood the potential harms of climate change. And now they're thinking, well, yeah, risk management is important and we should let people build reservoirs in case things get worse. Mm -hmm. So um, one thing that one like things like the Union Reservoir Expansion is a policy decision that you know, might be good to you know, consider or building new reservoirs it takes a long time to get new improvements yeah. on it. but 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 that's another thing another thing to consider awesome thank you so much for your feedback and all of this um you know okay all of this was it won't be possible without a robust education and outreach plan and so that's kind of my last point of, of an over, oh, sorry, that was great. Overarching goal is um, to increase and maintain watershed health. And we do that through creating local environmental stewards. We do that through education. And so this is all to say, like, this is why you can serve. This is, and it is all of those points of planning for our future demand, planning for the environment, making sure that we're being a steward of not only our watershed, but the Colorado River watershed. And, Continuing to increase. Oh. Yep. All right. Let me call you. Bye. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Do we have you with us? Oh, we're back. All right. I'm sorry, I cut out. Are we? Uh, did we uh, finish with Hope's presentation? Not quite yet. Just, just in. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Hope. That's a good discussion. Yes. Thank you. I'm going to close out. Yes, I'm about to close out. Awesome. But he's going. But yes, just just saying that all of these goals won't be possible without creating a robust education plan. 
So making sure that that's in there as well um, and creating stewards of our local watershed. Okay, the next one, thank you. Okay, very good. I just have one more slide. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm taking all the time. No, we're taking it. Um, and so these are just a few of the program ideas that, that we will continue with our programming that we have um, with Resource Central, with Northern, with Deficiency Works. Um, but just like I mentioned, education and outreach, code updates and design standards, um, Colorado Scape priority, prioritization, which is like the new zero scape. <laughs> it's not, that's kind of the word that we're choosing to use is Colorado Scape is increasing prioritizing native landscapes. Um, watering guidelines, turf replacements, um, but if you all have any specific program ideas that you'd like to see, you can talk about them now or if you think about them, you can send them to me, but um, these are just kind of examples of where we see our program going, but any um, feedback would be lovely. Okay, let's move on to the next item. Thanks again, Hope. Thank you. Uh, Jason, can you give us an update on your projects? Yes, sir. Um, so I've got three projects I'd like to give you an update on. So the South St. Brain pump station, uh, that project's currently uh, uh, on schedule, it's on budget, and uh, uh, we're looking at actually tying into the North St. Crane pipeline September 22nd. Uh, after which, once we've tied into that, we'll immediately, the following week, we'll be uh, uh, doing startup and testing and calibration and getting everything turned on, debugging and stuff like that. So we're actually hopeful that, you know, um, at the beginning of October, we'll be able to actually utilize that and we can start taking, uh, diverting water from the South St. Crane Creek um, through the pump station and pumping into the uh, North St. Brain uh, pipeline. Um, so so uh, anyway, so the pump station project's going great. And then um, kind of going back to the South St. Brain uh, Creek diversion structure. So, um, you know, we've, we've been doing an investigation into um, uh, our diversion structure there and our ownership there. Uh, and so um, through, a, through an investigation, we found that, you know, uh, ownership and everything like that is kind of in question. Um, a lot of that stuff was purchased late 1800s, early 1900s, and throughout you know the past century. And so, anyway, we have um, uh, we have uh, guidance from council as to uh, what they would like us to do. And we're going to start working with the adjacent property owners out there to firm uh, our ownership and our diversion structure out there, and at the same time, probably help those residents firm their ownership as well and help establish uh, property lines and stuff. Uh, there's been a lot of question, you know, over the past, you know, a couple couple decades about who owns what, and so we're going to try to put that to bed. And so I've begun discussions with all the um, interested parties and property owners out there. And so far, uh, verbal conversations is going good. I think they have an understanding of what it is we all want to try to accomplish. So I'm hoping within the next probably six months to maybe actually be proposing a, a final resolution as to how we're going to uh, secure our property out there. And then. Um, the, the last project I want to give you an update on was the uh, Button Rock Outlet. So a couple years ago, you might uh, recall that we had rehabbed the outlet uh, to Button Rock Dam. And that, uh, that entailed um, uh, rehabilitating the gate and the hydraulics and the cylinder and all that stuff. But one thing we weren't able to do was replace the bronze seat that the gate shuts down on. So that bronze seat's embedded in the actual outlet frame and everything. It was the way they constructed it, designed it, was never meant to be replaced. So um, fast forward a couple of years to today, we are in September, we're gonna shut down the outlet, let water go over the spillway, and uh, we're going to rip out that old, um, that old bronze seat and replace it with a two-piece seat that will be serviceable in the future. Um, and so in doing so, the, reason, the main reason to do this is um, that Valzona, it's like an epoxy that we applied in there, um, it, it's not really working. I mean, every time we shut the gate, you know, water's just spraying off in different directions. And we'd really like to have better control of our regulated gate. Um, so long story short, um, in partnership with um, uh, our plant operators, O&M, uh, 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 Schnabel, AMS, American Mine Services, um, uh, 
who else is involved? Uh, you got Prime Machine. Um, uh, there's a whole bunch of players involved. Uh, we're going to shut down the outlet in September for probably three to four weeks to finally rip that out and get that replaced. So that that that'll be a lot of um, a lot of players and a lot of uh, scheduling and stuff. But uh, so far, it, you know, our probability for success is very high based on uh, past projects and experience uh, such as this. So if you want to see Button Rock spill in September, this is your chance. Right. It's technically yeah, it's spilling now, cool. but it'll uh, yeah, it'll uh, it'll uh, it'll definitely be spilling uh, throughout the yeah, most of September and into uh, early October. Yeah. Beautiful. Thanks, Jason. Any other questions, Jason? Thank you. Um, just looking ahead on uh, item ten of the schedule for future board meetings. Uh, and the information that we got in our packet, uh, is that look like we're going to look at Windy Gap for projects and cash and loot review. Those are two items that look like they're scheduled for next month's meeting. Any changes in that at all? Uh, I, I have not, no. Um, yeah, that's just a verbal update for the Windy Gap. Cash flows are a quarterly review. Right, right. So, so no one can see that. No. Uh, I, the, the one thing I did want to talk about a bit at this point, just to, um, I, I sent out an email to the board. The uh, Colorado River Connectivity Project around the Windy Gap Reservoir is having a groundbreaking on Tuesday, August 23rd, um, we did kind of ask Northern today, um, is there anything big going on or just turn a shovel of dirt? And they said, nah, just turn a shovel of dirt. <laughs> so while everybody is welcome to go, um, there's ways to go just to, um, they're not gonna do a tour. I didn't know if they'd do a tour of the plant, you know, pumping plant, or, existing dam or anything else but um, they said they're gonna just a real short real short photo op so anybody's welcome to come give us a holler if you want the details but um, that is good news though that that connectivity channel um, we did i did we did hear from northern district today that i heard that but i hadn't had got a confirmed all of the money all the final money from the natural Resources Conservation Service, NRCS, for that project has now been committed. Um, we kind of were told it was committed, but, but it wasn't official yet from Washington, D.C., which is kind of important. <laughs> and, uh, but we, we've been told it's all in hand now and, and that the contract can move forward as a, uh, a full-blown construction contract. Not much time left this year, unfortunately, but. It's good news that that's able to move forward. Great, great. Well, you know, speaking of tours, sorry I wasn't, and I guess Scott wasn't able to go this morning, but uh, how and Allison, how, how did the tour go for you guys this morning? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, th I thought it was great. Um, of course, you know, I, I have, I love, Good construction sites and, and things. So, um, and there was a lot of really cool machinery at work uh, out there. That's for sure. Um, and I think just just more importantly, you know, I'm just always impressed uh, with with Northern Water and just kind of the the handle that they have on things. You know, I mean, it's not, um, you know, it's one, for one thing to go out and say, oh yeah, you know, Bureau of Reclamation is building a dam, or Corps of Engineers is building a dam. You know, but this is a a relatively kind of, you know, I, probably nobody's heard of Northern Water before, except for those of us who live around here, I suppose. And um, just how kind of what a handle they have on even these really big uh, projects. And so I just, I've always been really impressed with the, the way in which they kind of deal with things out there and and um, and just the people that are involved. And, and I just, I mean, I really enjoy it myself. So. That's great. Great. Allison, any comments? Um, yeah, I guess the, to add on to what Tom said and kind of elaborate is they spend a lot of time on public outreach. 
Um, and it really shows how much they try to make it transparent and accessible to people who are both invested in the project, but also people who are nearby. And I think that that has probably uh, contributed to the success and warmer reception than they might have felt otherwise. So I, I thought that was a really interesting aspect that you wouldn't normally see like inspire, you know, engineers who are in charge of a project taking two to three hours out of their day, several days a week to speak to public audiences. So that I think was really fascinating. Great, that's great. Any comments on the tour you went, did you not? Oh, yes, I did. I enjoyed it thoroughly. That's my first time back in the in the valley since the uh, groundbreaking. So um, I was delighted to see how much of the, the foundation was open and prepped and about half the plant done. And so um, slow, amazing amount of preparatory work yeah. done out there ready, um, ready to get going. It's going to really help help the dam start going up fast. So yeah, I was thoroughly, thoroughly glad to do it. Time-wise, uh, do they say it's on schedule? Um, yeah, I did mention that today, but um, the last when you got participants meeting, they showed the schedule. Based upon the expenditures, um, we're right on track. Um, we really are. Great, great. I told the council this, this really shows the benefits of forward engineering because we had way fewer surprises than you would expect, I think, in a budget of this size. That's good. That's good. Well, very good. Um, no further items. Anybody have anything before we adjourn? I'll, I'll jump in, Roger, with just a, an observation on, it's not really supremely relevant to our cash and loop conversation, but I was a bit surprised. Uh, Boulder and Lafayette worked out a, a deal with some um, landowners and some water is being conveyed and the Highland shares are up at 450,000 a share on this transaction, which is a big number. Um, and the CBT that's being conveyed, I can't remember if it's 90 units or 118. I just too many different deals. That's 68,000. And I've seen some 68,000s a unit on development when it's just ones and twos, because you pay what you pay. <laughs> but I haven't seen a municipality going in 68 um, for that big of a block. I was fairly surprised by that. Um, we are. Yeah. Very so, good. That, that's a $97,000 an acre foot <laughs> number based on that wow. 0 0.7 acre foot yield. So it's a really big number. Um, it's hard to fathom. Yeah. It was uh, just one last comment for me. I don't know if anybody watched uh, 60 Minutes last night, but I had quite a quite a segment on what's going on in the Colorado River with all the rest of the states. And I thought that was quite interesting. But uh, water continues to get uh, more and more important, obviously. So. Okay. Well, look forward to seeing all of you next month again. Thank you for your support and. Uh, that for a German. Thanks, Roger. Thank you, Roger. Roger and Allison, once again. Thank you, Roger.